Jesus Christ Church in Iowa, and it's Bedford or Medford? Bedford. Bedford. I, I get those two mixed up. Bedford, Iowa, and uh, we're so blessed to have them. I know that the message that they've been given uh, this morning for this house is uh, it's going to be a challenge. It always is, and uh, because it's the Word of God, and the Word of God sometimes really does challenge us. It reproves, it corrects, it, it instructs us in righteousness. And so uh, I just want to invite, I, I don't know, Kathy, are you going to say a few? No, no, no. Okay, all right. So Pastor Mike, why don't you come up and let's give uh, him a Livingstone welcome this morning. It's good to be back here. Uh, I need a lapel mic because I need my hands to preach. And this ties me up too much. So uh, I'm just very glad to be here. And as Pastor Allen said, I'm a, my ministry is one of a tilter. I tilt the wine bottles and I stir up the dregs. You know, Jeremiah had to uh, tear down, pluck up, and destroy before he could build up. And I think a lot of times we have uh, things in our lives that need to be plucked up, destroyed, and torn down. And the problem is, is we love so much of that. We've built it. We've spent a lot of time developing it, and it has to be torn down. Even some things we think are godly. Yeah. And so uh, I'm going to kind of be doing that. Is this ready? Yeah. This way. Oh, <laughs> is this already on? This is what we call teamwork. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Got it. Yeah, I think so. Hey, that works good. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was fairly smooth, wasn't it? <laughs> Anyway, I think we have things uh, many times that we do in the church and in the, in the things that we call of the kingdom of God that aren't. So I'm going to be ministering on some of those things this morning. I'm just going to minister on two or three or four or five or six <laughs> things, depending on how much I feel you can take. And, but that will open the door for, for our eyes to be open to expand who God is. You know, we have limited the Holy One of Israel so much. And I know we don't want to, but we do. Because we hold many traditions. Uh, we hold many things that are actually stopping the kingdom of God from operating. Uh, you know, many times in church, I know in our own church and in this church here, you've heard many times that God wants to do something new. You've, have you heard that? You go to any church and you can hear that God wants to do something new. Well, in order for him to do something new, something old has to be done away with. God is not going to add, you know, to our building, so to speak. You, you know what I mean? I mean, when the temple was made, both the New Jerusalem, you know, last year, how many of you were last year when I preached about the sign of the city? Okay, we're in a, uh, both the city, the New Jerusalem, and the temple that was made in the Old Testament were made to certain specifications. They were so much, so long, uh, so wide, so tall, and certain things were placed in those temples, and certain things are in the New Jerusalem. And so when God says, does anybody know what edify means? What does edify mean? Huh? It means to enlarge, doesn't it? It means to enlarge. Well, how's God going to enlarge us if he's going to keep uh, the temple to a certain specification? Things were put in place by God, and, and he told, I think he told Moses, didn't he? He said, be, or was it Solomon? He said, be sure you build it according to specification. You had to be built exactly. You couldn't put anything out of order or it wasn't going to work right. It was going to start taking away from the presence of God. And I see so much uh, sometimes out of order in the church. And, and I'm not saying I've got it all in order. It's just that, you know, this is a growing process. And as you ask and as you see God and you begin to uh, desire him, he'll start to show you things that are out of order. So I've got to start where God starts with me and where we preach in the church. And so we start sharing things and we start revealing things that are out of order. Edify means to enlarge. How many of you have ever moved? From one's house to another. You take the furniture out of a room and what do you say about the room? This room looks bigger. What did you do? You just edified the room. So that's what God wants to do to us. He wants to edify us. He wants to remove things out of us that don't belong to you. We've got a beautiful Old Testament illustration of the good kings and the bad kings. If you read through First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, you'll find that when a good king came to power, what would he do to the temple? He'd start removing the asterisk poles. He'd start removing the false altars. He would start removing the prostitution booths. What was he doing to the temple? He was edifying it. It was so that more of God could move in. 
The problem was all those Asherah poles and those prostitution booths and those altars. I mean, there's one story about a king who went to Damascus and he saw an altar that he liked there. And so he had one built and he brought it back and he put it in the place of where the Lord's altar was. And he put the Lord's altar over on the side. And on one he would inquire of the Lord and on the other one he would, he would offer the morning and evening sacrifices. There's a real message right there of what the church has done. Sometimes we move altars around or we see an altar built somewhere else and we bring it in and we move God's altar over here and we still do God's stuff on both of them. But one of them is from another country, another place. And so when Josiah, it, the Bible says about, yeah, another kingdom. When Josiah came to power, it said there was no king that turned to the Lord like Josiah did, either before or after David. And if you read what he did, he was adamant about getting bad stuff out of the temple. He didn't just pull it out. He'd cut it down. He'd burn it. Then he'd pulverize it. And then he'd spread the ashes out. So that's how you ought to feel if you've been edified. Edification doesn't mean that we make you feel better and give you a psycho-religious religious talk that makes you feel good about yourself or about God. It's you should feel cut down, burned, pulverized, and spread out <laughs> by God, not by man. You, you, you know, the devil has a way of doing that. You walk out condemned. God has a way of cutting things down, and because of the empowerment of his voice, he gives you a hope that doesn't exist with the world system. Yes. You feel good that you're a rat. <laughs> You do. You walk out, and there's a goodness that you feel. You, you, you recognize that things need to be straightened out, but there's a hope that's attached to the voice of God. And that's really my message is the voice versus the letter. Is there's, a, a, there's a grace, there's a righteousness that's attached to that that gives you a hope that I can be changed. Yes. Condemnation leads you in a, in a position. That's the devil's uh, uh, counterfeit of conviction. It leaves you no hope. And that's why people are so despondent when they get condemned. It's because there's no hope in it. But God always, whenever he cuts something down, he gives you a hope that he's going to build something back up. So when you get edified, if you really get healed from God, let's take the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You really get healed from God, you just got edified. Something that the bad king put in you, God just took out. Because who's the good king? Who's the good king that comes in power? Jesus. He wants to edify you. Now, if Josiah cut things down, burned them, pulverized them, and then spread the ashes, and he was a human king, what do you think Jesus wants to do? There's going to be some upheaval inside of us. But he's going to replace it. Jesus, he's the good king. And so, you know, so many churches, they spend so much time trying to edify people, trying to get the bad out. They never bring the kingdom of God back into the temple. And you can read about that even in the Old Testament because it says even though they cleaned out the temple, what was the, what's the one phrase that keeps following all of those kings? It says the high places were never taken down. They, so they did a great job of edifying. And you know churches like that. They preach on sin. They preach on sin. You've got to get this out. You've got to get this out of your life. But they keep leaving the high places out there. And we don't bring God back in to the temple. So when you get healed, it's not just so that you can go to a ball game pain-free. It's not so that you can just go uh, shopping pain-free or go on vacation pain-free. You got healed because something of the wrong king came out, but something has to be placed back in you from the kingdom of God. Otherwise, you've just got a house that's swept and put in order. And what's the New Testament scripture there, folks? Everything we do is a responsibility. That's good. Everything. That's right. This kingdom is a, is a it's an ever increasing kingdom. Of his government there shall be no end. I'm gonna meddle here. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I do that a lot, don't I? I'm real big on church attendance. Because there's an anointing in the corporate that you can't get by yourself. Right. That's, right. That's, right. That's good. Amen. I've had people say, well, I can get just as much of God elk hunting as I can being in church. 
Well, that's true. If, if that's all, if you just have to get for yourself, that might be true. But you know, this is a kingdom that has to do with other people. It has to do with the people in your city, the people in this church, your pastor, the praise and worship leaders. You know, I've got a feeling that if everybody here would cut loose, it would affect who they are. It would affect how they play. This is all about, this isn't just about me. Yeah, I can stay up on the mountain. You say, well, you come here because you preach. We've come here for years and I never preached. It's because we believe in the corporate anointing. And I know that you live in a recreational area. <laughs> this is easier, easier to preach in Iowa because there's nothing to do there. <laughs> We've got, well, there's not much where we live. Recreationally, I'm serious. But even if there was, we'd still be in church on Sunday morning because that's where the corporate anointing is. Yeah. And this yeah. kingdom is about changing this world system. Yes. Yes. And we claim it's important and we sing songs how important it is, but how, what's our actions really speaking? We've got people out. You know, I don't know. Cause, like I say, I don't attend here. But my guess is that probably during hunting season, I'm a big hunter, right? You all know that, most everybody here knows that. I imagine during hunting season, there are people here that are out hunting instead of being in church. Just a question. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me wherever I go. Now, where do you think Jesus wants to be on Sunday morning during elk season? Does he want to be hunting or does he want to be here? Very, very easy, this is an easy question. Where does he want to be? Huh? You think he wants to be with his body? Yes. <laughs> well, I can get him. He's, he, I'm with his body when I'm out there. Yeah, but how are you affecting the body? How are you? What, what message are you placing out there? Now, I'm going to take some scriptures here I don't wanna, since I'm into this already. How many of you are familiar with the scripture? Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And how do we teach that? Like I say, I, I don't go to pre-service prayer. I don't watch prayer, but I hear people. It'll be a month ago tomorrow. And please don't get angry at me when I say this. I heard a guy and he said, I bind the devil over all the people in the state of Iowa. <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, now, wait a minute. You know, I'm not questioning the man's heart. We don't like to see the devil pounding people. But that's a doctrine that, we, that came up in the church and, it, and we've developed it. It's the letter. It produces nothing. We don't have authority over the devil over other people's lives. What is that scripture really talking about? It's talking about what are you binding in your own life and what are you loosing in your own life? So if we sing how important this is, we're saying with our mouth, but what is our attitude really loosing in the church over this community? My wife is a counselor. She's really the pastor in our church. I'm the tipper. <laughs> She's the one that cleans up all my messes when I preach. And so she deals individually. She's always carried that gift with her. Even when she was in high school, before she got spirit filled, she would counsel students. See, that's what she has loosed on the earth. So she carries an atmosphere of a pastoral counselor. So she'll be standing in line at Walmart or a grocery store, and somebody, she's got avocados in her hand or you know, bananas or peaches or whatever it is she's buying, and all of a sudden, somebody will just start talking to her and start pouring out their life to her, intimate details of their life to this perfect stranger. Why? It's because she carries, she has loosed in heaven the atmosphere of the counselor around her. And not everybody does that, but once in a while somebody will do that. And she'll come back and she'll say, I don't even know these people and they're telling me intimate details about their life. It's because that's what you've loosed on the earth. When you come in here and we praise and the leader says to dance, what are you going to loose or what are you going to keep bound up? I'm not going to dance. 
You just bound the Spirit of God. Whatever you bind, it's a, that is a responsibility scripture. It's whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what do you want loosed over your city? And what do you want bound? Some like it, some don't. <laughs> what are we going to lose? We claim we want the Spirit of God loosed in our city. What we don't realize is, church, you are the effector of the invisible realm, the heavenly realm, the demonic realm, as well as the kingdom heaven realm. We're the, we're the effectors of it. That's the responsibility he's put on us. It's scary in a sense. It's awesome. It's a tremendous responsibility. And it's something that sometimes I'm not, my flesh really doesn't care for. So what are we binding and what are we loosing? I have another church that I've listened to and they bound the spirit of crime over their city for 18 years. And it's still one of the most 10 deadly cities to be murdered in in America. I would think after 18 years, you begin to get the idea that something's not working. <laughs> that maybe we need to look at something else. What does bind and loose mean? And most of the people who prayed that aren't even there anymore. What if they had taken that 18 years and prayed that for themselves? And so, God, I need to bind everything that's of the demonic realm, every asterisk pole, everything that's in my temple. If I bind that, I'm going to loose everything in the spirit of God that I can. I wonder what that would affect our cities. How much more it would affect our cities than just saying, I bind the spirit of crime over our city. <laughs> if it worked, Jesus would have done it, wouldn't he? Have? We as leaders, leaders, have to be very careful. Doesn't mean we have to be perfect, right? None of us could do it. But every time God reveals something to us, we have to take the authority that God gave us over all the power of the enemy. What's the power of the enemy? The power of temptation. We use the authority to start binding that in our life because what we loose on earth will be loosed over our congregation. walked into a church one time and lust was rampant in the church oh, man and this here's what's bad is you, you know something's wrong but you can't quite put your finger on it and there was lust it was just in the church you just feel it yeah it's terrible and couldn't figure it out well come to find out the pastor was having an adulterous affair with one of the elders wives and that was loosed over the congregation how long four years nobody knew it we knew it. I mean, we knew something was wrong, but we didn't know what it was. We had another man that we went down to a large city, and we went down to a group of meetings, and he was from another country, and this pastor had brought him in, and they were talking, and they were saying it was like Pensacola, that the, the God was going to break out like Pensacola. And Kathy and I are standing there, and there's something not right. There's, some, there's something that's really fishy about it. It's just you know, yuck. You know what I mean? Some of you women, I know you're probably more in tune with this. You get around a man, and you can feel the lust. That's what they've loosed in the atmosphere. So you know that they've done something behind closed doors that they've loosed on the earth. And now they carry that atmosphere with them. They don't even have to look at you. You just know it's there. Jesus had this down so much that he knew their thoughts. Their thoughts were creating an atmosphere. And he'd say, Jesus knowing their thoughts. I sometimes wonder if I could have handled being around that guy. Could I have been Peter, James, or John, or put up, you know, with a guy who knew what you were always talking about, knew what you were always thinking because of the atmosphere that you were putting out, because of what you were loosing on the earth? You know, one time they wanted to loose fire down on heaven. Remember that story? And they even name dropped. You know how people name drop? 
Have you ever experienced name dropping before? You know what I mean by that? You know, you want somebody to think you're really somebody, so you'll say you'll know somebody, or you've you got their autograph or someone. So they said, you want us to call fire down like Elijah did? And Jesus said, what? You don't know what spirit you're of. Anyway, we went to this church, and this guy was standing up there, and Am look, you got to know, you got to understand, the church was what, probably as many people as there are here, do you think? Yeah, easy? Everybody in the church, the guy was standing up on the platform right there, and everybody on the church was down before him, and Kathy and I are the only two left standing in the, in the chairs. Now, do you know what it's like to be the only two there, and they keep hinting at you to come down, you're missing God if you're not down here, you know, because this is the new move of God and everything. You know what it's like to sit there and make a stand? And you're the only two people. Yeah, we know, so because we, we had to do that a lot. So this one couple, they sold everything they had. They were going to go be missionaries in this person's country. And they got over there, and guess what he did? The, uh, guess what? The, the guy who was leading the big special speaker, he ran prostitution houses with little boys. And there he is leading up there, and nobody knows it, except Kathy and I know something's wrong, but we, I didn't have this, the knowledge to say, this is what's going on. We just know something's wrong. And nobody knew. All these people, many are sitting here, all up there on their knees and thinking this is the new Pensacola and this is the new God's move. Because he had loosed something on the earth in his home country, now he carried that atmosphere with him. So what are we going to lose and what are we going to buy? You're the hope of the earth. What are you going to lose? This is important. Like I said, I'm real big on church. People say, well, you're putting me under legalism. You're making me go to church. Listen, if you'd rather desire to be out there, that's fine. Be out there. I'm wanting to know why your desire isn't to be here. Because it says of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. It says those who delight themselves in the Lord, it said God will give them the desires of their heart. That doesn't mean he gives me what I want. That means he gives me his desires in my heart right. and his desires to meet here. So how can you tell me that you have Jesus in your heart and he's number one and he's my pilot and I'm only the co-pilot and you're off running around doing recreational things during church time? I don't get that. You can clean up the mess after I leave. <laughs> Hey, that's the advantage of being a special speaker. He gets to clean it all up. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Bye. So we're supposed to follow him wherever he goes, not make him follow us everywhere we go and try to make excuses for we're not to use our liberty as a starting point or for an opportunity of the flesh. Paul would never write for you to, in fact, Paul wrote just the opposite. He said, there are those who forsake the assembling of themselves together. So you're supposed to assemble together, not just come to church. You assemble as a body part and you're, and you're supposed to function in that bodily part. If it's missing, we're missing part of the body. You may have the word for somebody. You may have the encouragement, not, not just in the word, but your actions that somebody may need. For instance, the people who are up here leading praise and worship, they may be having a bad time. They may be having discouragement. But when they see you loosing the kingdom of God in the earth, it encourages them and causes them to come alive and to defeat the thing that's in them that's trying to defeat them. Yeah. Same with the preacher. When Alan stands up here, your job, our, our, our uh, I don't, job is a bad job. Our, what we're supposed to be doing is drawing out of the, the person who's up here speaking. Yeah. Not sleeping, not yawning, not going for a coffee. Coffee's fine. There's a time for God. There's a time for elk hunting. God he gives you all things richly to enjoy. But when he's meeting, he wants you to be here. And if you really delight yourself in the Lord, he'll grace you with the empowerment and the desire and the wannabe. Jesus said this, it said this, wrote this about Jesus, said, zeal for your house has eaten me up. 
It's eating me up. You ought to be eating up to get here. Can't wait to get here. I've got zeal. I'm, I'm, I can't wait to get to this place. Not, oh, God, we got to go to church. What are you losing when you say that? And if you have a zeal that's eating you up, what are you losing there? That's the responsibility that we've been given. You've got to decide whether you really want to be in this thing because this is a war, folks. This isn't come to ch play church, sing a few nice songs, feel good, and walk out and think we're all okay. People get killed. People die bringing you what we have. That's how important it is. It's not that, it's the song that we sang about the weight is lifted. Yeah, the weight is lifted off me spiritually, but I'm still carrying all this. <laughs> it wears me out to do that much dancing and jumping. <laughs> and it is altitude. Yeah, that's, that's it. It's altitude. <laughs> that's what it is, yeah. Oh, thank you. I like that better. Many times we do things in church, we, we, we substitute, and I'm sharing this with Pastor, we substitute rather than represent. In other words, prayer is used many times as a substitute rather than a representation. In other words, a representation means it's something that we're supposed to do. I very seldom, hardly ever, have a prayer for people after church. Why? Because most things aren't a matter of prayer. Most things are a matter of you doing something about it. Not prayer. We go in and, Here's a doctrine we had in our church, and this is one we need to do away with. I did away with it without preaching about it. I just did away with it by changing it a little bit. And uh, like I say, I don't know if you do this here, but how many of you have heard of proxy prayer where you stand in for somebody? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We got that. Here we go. We got that from the Roman centurion. Remember who went in and stood in for his servant? Remember that? And, of course, the church makes a doctrine out of it, and now we have proxy prayer all the time. People come in and they, whoever's on your heart, and you stand in for them to get healed, saved, or whatever. And it used to drive me crazy because was, I thought it was a true doctrine. I didn't know the difference between the letter and the voice. And so people would come forward and they would stand in for people. Well, see, I'm the type of person that I watch to see what works and what doesn't. Because everything in this Bible worked. Every word came to pass. Everybody that got prayed for got healed. If that's not happening, I'm just inclined to think something's wrong with us. That we're doing something wrong. And so when people would stand in for these people, uh, I would watch their lives. And guess what happened? Guess what happened? Nothing. And we'd keep doing that, and we'd stand in for different people, and we'd have them on our hearts, and we'd stand in for people, and we'd have them on our hearts, and nothing would happen. They would die. They'd still be sick. They never got saved. Everything, you know. We'd go up, we'd have our nice time in prayer, fall down, have our spiritual orgasm, and everybody would feel real great and think we fulfilled what God wanted to do. So finally one day the pastor said to me, he said, Mike, you come up and do proxy prayer. You pray for these people that are going to, I'm going, I've been waiting for this. <laughs> so when it was, I think it was like three people that came up, and I, I went and I, I laid hands on the first one. I said, look, I said, the reason that God placed these people on your heart is because you're supposed to go do something. You're supposed to hear God. Either you're supposed to go lay hands on them. You're supposed to go preach to them. Maybe you're just supposed to pray with them, for them. Uh, you're, in other words, you're supposed to take the responsibility to hear God and go do what it, that person is on your heart. And I prayed that over those people, and I'd say, God, you give them the boldness to, to, to minister. You give them the boldness, and you give them, and cause them to lo uh, lo lay their life down so that they can hear you and that they'll hear your voice and that they'll be operate in your voice. That was the end of that doctrine in our church. Nobody ever came forward for proxy prayer ever again. You know why? Huh? Yeah, why? Because they knew, because it put them under the responsibility of actually doing something that God was speaking to do. But nobody wants to do that because it costs us our life. Church service will cost you your life. I could be up hunting right now, too. I'm, I'm laying that part of my life down. Well, yeah, that's because you have to preach. No, we come here. We have always gone to church. 
Is laying your life down a part of the kingdom of God? <laughs> Some of y'all don't sound, don't sound too sure. <laughs> that wasn't a real strong, yes. <laughs> that was kind of a, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I want to do this or not. <clears throat> this is of high value. Yes. And what we do, what we bind, and what we loose affects the realm in this church, affects the realm of the people, affects your city. And if you really want to bind the devil in the world, then let's try loosing something else. Let's try binding the devil by loosing something else in the earth. Born again is another. Salvation is another concept that we have not taken fully of what it means. We still hang on to the concept of salvation that Martin Luther had 500 years ago, that salvation means that you're going to heaven. You'll hear people say that. You said this. I've said this. I got saved back in 1972. Anybody ever hear anybody say, I got saved? Maybe not 72, because that dates me a little bit. But you've heard people say, I got saved in 1987. No, you got born again in 1987. Now you're starting, and now here's the question. Have you entered into salvation? Because born again doesn't mean you're saved. Born again just means that you've seen a facet of the kingdom of God. And now you have the choice as to whether to enter into that facet. And you don't just get born again once. Jesus used a natural illustration. I can ask the women in here, and I can even ask the men. If you continue to have unprotected sex with your wife, how many kids will you have? Just one? Just one? How many children will you have? Let's go back to the days of Methuselah. You're going to live to be 900 years old. How many children do you think you'd have? Huh? Too many. I, actually, I'm going, I'm going there I'm pretty quick here. Just a second. So every day, yeah, way too many. Every time God reveals a facet of himself, that's an area that you now get born again in. That's a child now that you get to raise. Remember when God said to Abraham, your descendants will be as numerous as what? The sand in the, in the, in the, in the, yeah, and the stars? Well, we know he wasn't talking about natural. He only had a few more kids. That's how big God is. That's how many born-again experiences you can have. And how, many, how much grains of sand are there in the sea? How many stars are there in heaven? That's how big God is. And just like what we see in the natural, how many, I've known people, Kathy and I have known people, we've known leaders, that when God reveals something to him, people will abort it. And so it makes me wonder, you know, God, God shares a, an insight or he calls them to a specific ministry or calls them to deal something, do something with certain people, and they'll see it. In other words, they got born again in it, but they abort it. Because just like she said, that's too much. How many of you now want children that are in your elderly age? See, I had, see, I had no children. Do you know why? I didn't want any. You know why? Because I'm selfish. I didn't want kids interfering with my life. At least I admitted it. I mean, most people, I shouldn't say most, a lot of people have children for selfish reasons. I've had people tell me, I want somebody to take care of me in my old age. You ever heard that too? <laughs> How selfish is that? I want to live through my child. I want them, I want to live through all the things I didn't get to do to go through them. I want a new baby so that I can have attention and everybody will come up and say, oh, the pretty little baby, oh, congratulations. And when that wears off, they have another one, and they have another one, and they have another one. Those children are left basically to raise themselves by society, computer games, the media, all of these other different things. I'm saying that for a reason. Think of the natural, but think in, think in the spiritual. What does that mean? Is that God gives us born-again experiences 
over and over again. And how many times do we abandon it and let the world system raise that thing that God gave us or we abort it? And it makes me wonder, this would be a kick in the teeth, wouldn't it? Is if the abortion that's going on out there in the natural realm is a result of God trying to share with his people and we've aborted the children that God has given us and what we've loosed on the earth or what we've loosed in heaven is now loosed on the earth. How many churches this morning are talking or speaking against all those abortion clinics and abortion and everything? And we may not even realize it's been because of us. Because the, the scripture says there are two cities, right? There's Babylon and there's the New Jerusalem. And these two cities both use the word of God, one by the letter and one by the spirit. And Jesus said, come out of her, my people you share in her sins and share in her plagues that lets me know we're in her yeah. and it says all the slain on the earth are found in Babylon so if we're aborting these things we're having a hand in the slain of the earth not to condemn us Jesus doesn't throw us out because we're in Babylon he's trying to save us out of it and the idea is that you see that you're in it and you're trying to come out of it. Now you're accounted unto righteousness. Now you're being saved by grace. Now you're being born again and entering into salvation if you're coming out of it. But don't sit there and sing the songs and say you got born again back in 1972 and now you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and now I'm being saved by grace and now I'm being justified. No, those are all action words. not an automatic it's not an automatic you say what good's the letter then we read the Bible but what do I hold in my hand here the Bible right this is either the tree of life or it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil it's how you partake of it that's going to determine which one it is there weren't two separate trees in the garden there was only one tree it's how you partake of it. When we partake of this without God's voice, it now becomes the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the letter that kills. It brings forth death. And so every time, we, why do we use this? Why, what, what, what's the purpose of using the word of God? Paul writes that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So we preach out of the Bible. I quote scripture. You notice I haven't read anything yet. I just quote certain scriptures and certain scriptures come to you. Why? Because we're, we're, we're desiring, our intense desire is God. Can he bring these scriptures alive again yeah. and turn them into manna? Yeah. Have you ever written your, read your Bible? You've been reading your Bible and all of a sudden the scripture jumps out at you and a new meaning comes out of it? Well, God just took the, yesterday's manna and made it today's. He just spoke to you, and the life of God came into you. And so we preach out of this, and we read it. Why? Because we're desperate to get God's voice today. I'm praying. Uh, this has been my prayer for weeks since I knew I was going to do this. I said, God, you must speak to all of us. It's not me giving you a message. It's me giving all of us, including me, a message. And I want to hear God speak to me. Because that's where the life is. If there's no God speaking, forget it. We're done. If you're in the letter, you become lackadaisical. You be, lose your seal. You lose your, your uh, uh, passion for the things of the kingdom of God. You start to lose even your looks. You'll start to look down. You'll start to look. We've been in church. Remember that church we went to in, that other, in Nebraska? And everybody was in bondage. Even though they were singing how free they were. I mean, everybody there, well, you could feel that. That's what, they, that's what the leader had loosed upon his congregation, was bondage. Law, without the Spirit of God. And so I've got, I'm come here and I'm desperate. That's why we came here. Why do you think we come to this church? Because this church has the potential to hear and to speak the voice of God. That's the most, how, how are you going to measure the importance of God speaking to you to the boat show? I don't get that. 
Listen, when you run off and go to your child's ball game or your Christmas dinner, your Christmas party, and you skip church, don't wonder why your children love the things of the world because that's what you loosed in their life. If you want to bind the spirit of the world, you don't just bind it. You lose something else. You lose the spirit of God. You lose the seal of God. You lose the seal of your house is eating me up. Well, you don't have any kids. How can you know that? I've been in this a long time, folks. 34 years. I know there's been people in here that's been, uh, maybe not in here, but people that have been in this thing longer than I have. But I've seen it all. We've gone to, a, we have a small church, but I've been to a lot of places. I've dealt with a lot of church people, church leaders. I know what I'm talking about. And people always use the voice of God. Well, God told me to go to the ball game. God told me to go to this function. He told me to go elk hunting. Have you ever, I know you surely you've heard this one. God told me to divorce this wife and marry this one. Anybody ever hear that? I just watched a major ministry a couple of weeks ago. You'd know it. If I gave the name, you'd know who it was. They just got remarried. I've got to be careful what I say here. They just got remarried, and they were given a marriage seminar. And one of the partners, this is their third marriage, and one of them was, this is the second marriage, and they were, this, this, was a, this is a marriage seminar. And they said, whatever it takes to make your marriage good, even if you have to watch pornography to get married. You know what was really bad? The church was eating it up and loving it. Now, what did they lose? What did they lose and what did they bind? So we want the manna. What, 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 what does God's voice represent? represent? Represents the manna, right? It was only good for one day. Tomorrow, this service will be yesterday's manna. And I've got to hear God tomorrow. What are you speaking to me tomorrow? Is it great for today? If the service is good and the music is good and God shows up and he speaks and we get revelation and we get new meanings to scriptures? Absolutely. But tomorrow it will be yesterday's manna. So what's the purpose of the manna? It's to become your flesh, isn't it? What did God, here we go. God used another natural illustration. What we eat is what we become. <laughs> and what I eat lets me know what my flesh can and cannot do. You know what I mean by that? See, I cannot reach down and touch my toes <coughs> because of what I've eaten. <laughs> and the exercise is in that too because remember when Paul said bodily exercise profits what? But godly exercise profits much, right? So we, can, we take exercise and the manna that we feed on, and it'll let your flesh know what it can and cannot wear. Think spiritually. Where your flesh can and cannot go, and what your flesh can do and cannot do. See, what can I wear? I know there's some women in here that probably when you were younger, you wore a particular style of bathing suit. Your flesh probably is telling you you can't do that anymore. <laughs> you don't have to go try it on. You already know. I'm not, look, I'm not trying to make people feel bad. I'm, I'm wanting you to see a spiritual concept here, okay? Don't think that. That doesn't make any difference. I mean, like I said, bodily exercise profits a little, you know, what we eat would probably profit a little or much. <laughs> but it'll let you know what you can and cannot wear. You go, I know women do this, and men do it to some extent, but women are even greater. They go in and you try on clothes, don't you? And you see what looks good and what doesn't look good, right? So your flesh will let you know what you can and cannot wear. Well, it's the same way in the spirit realm. Is that When the manna becomes our flesh, it'll know what we can wear and what we cannot wear. When the manna becomes my flesh, I can wear dancing now in front of the Lord. I can wear that now. But I cannot wear dullness. It'll let me know where I can go and where I cannot go. I can't, my flesh can, listen. <laughs> my
my flesh will let me know that I cannot go elk hunting on Sunday morning. I can't wear that anymore. But I can wear the kingdom of God, and I can wear it. It'll let me know what I can wear. And I can wear being with God's people and enjoying the corporate anointing of God. That's what it'll let my flesh know what I can. The manna will let me know what I can and cannot wear. I cannot wear adultery. I cannot wear fornication. I cannot wear lackadaisicalness. I cannot wear lack of passion. The manna lets me know my flesh cannot wear that anymore. It doesn't look good. We're so concerned about our... You want to be physically attractive, do you not? You want to dress fairly physically attractive, isn't that right? Then why don't we carry that on into the spirit realm and let's dress physically attractive for the kingdom of God. I mean, we are doing it for the people, but what about the poor God? Look what he's got to look at over the face of the earth. Do you think it, it, it encourages him? Do you think he loves to see people jumping and dancing and praising and really coming from the heart? Not just doing it as a, as a letter thing, you know, because... Well, it's what we do. This is our tradition. You know, God said that the traditions of man make the, the spoken word of God of none effect. And we hold many traditions. And that's why I don't many times pray after service, because that's a tradition that we have carried on into. If God's calling you to do it, that's fine. I, I don't have a problem with it. But if God's not, many times we do it because it's a tradition that the church has always done. What if God wants you to be healed like one of the ten lepers, that you're healed as you're on your way to show yourself to the high priest? Remember the ten lepers? He said, go, show yourself. He didn't lay hands on them. He didn't pray. He just said, go. Show. And they were healed what? As they went. Many times we get healed as we go. But if I lay hands on you and start quoting the letter over you, that's going to nullify the way God wants to heal you. God always healed in a different way. Isn't it amazing that we never grabbed onto clay in the blind eye service? When was the last time you went to a clay in the blind eye service? How come we didn't turn that into a doctrine? You know why? Because you'll get sued. You better make sure you're hearing the voice of God when that comes up, doesn't it, right? But we'll take the Roman centurion, we'll take all of these other doctrines, and we'll just make the letter out. Because if it fails, we just sweep it under the rug. And the problem is, you say, these people will say, here's, here's our understanding, here's man's concept. Well, at least we're doing something. At least we're doing something. Yeah, but Jesus said, many will come to me in that day and say, didn't we do miracles in your name? Uh, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Uh, didn't we prophesy in your name? And what did he say? He said, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. You were doing God things, but it wasn't by my voice. If you read through your Gospels, you'll catch this. You'll see the devil constantly trying to get Jesus to do God stuff without God. Turn these stones into bread. Cast yourself, for it's written. The angels have charge. Let's even use the letter. The angels have charge over you. Come down from the cross, then we'll believe you. Show us a sign. At one point, the crowd was about to come and make him king. He knew he was called to be king. I mean, how easy would that have been for Jesus? Oh, yeah, this is a good way to be king. They're voting me in instead of me having to go to the cross. God has specific ways he wants to do something. That's why it's so important to hear his voice. That's why I've got to hear his voice as to every message that I give. Pastor Allen shared the same thing. I mean, it's just one week after week after week. It's I've got to get in a place to hear his voice. Because with his voice comes the empowerment, comes the grace, comes the hope. Come, it, everything is centered around the voice. When we talk about Jesus and we say Jesus is in us and Jesus is our man, you're talking about the voice of God because that's what separated him from every other man. He was made just like us. But what separated him was he only did what the Father said to do. He only went where the Father said to go. So every time I'm invited, even to preach here, I have to say, God, is this what you want? Or is this just a good idea? And I'm not questioning the compassion of people who do these things because we want to see people healed, right? But Jesus, when he went to the pool of Bethesda, he only healed the one man. 
He never ministered according to the need that he saw with his eyes or that he heard with his ears. He ministered according to the need of what God was speaking. That's good. Thank you. That's good. He left everybody else there sick. I know what Americans would do. We'd pray and then the one guy would get healed. We'd go ask everybody else to pray for him. Then we'd build a church there and start our tape ministry. And we'd run around and tell everybody about the guy we healed. That's Americans. But Jesus only healed the one man. You know that the man that was set at the gate beautiful, it said he was set there daily for how many years? 38. It was 38 or 40. 38? 38. Thank you. You know Jesus walked past him and saw that need. He was in the temple at 12 years old. And he said, I must be about my father's business. How come Jesus didn't ask, can I pray for you? If God commands you to, look, I'm, I'm talking about the voice of God. And people who delight themselves in God, people are going to say, well, yeah, but if you say preach on the voice of God, nobody will do anything. People who are hungry after God, God will speak to them. And you disobey that voice once or twice, you're going to be a sorry dude. The next time God speaks, you're going to jump at the chance to obey because you don't want to go through disobeying. Because you recognize what happened by your disobedience. And it will eat you alive, I know, from experience. How many of you have ever heard a man by the name of Casey Tree? Minister. One, two, three, four, five. We were in a conference one time, and he preached a message called, it's a lot, a lot, a lot along the lines of what I'm ministering here this morning. He called it adrenaline faith. And he said that when people come forward, he says adrenaline will cause you to be able, you know, when you have pains in your arms and, you know, legs or whatever, he says the emotion of the moment, you being the center of attention, and the adrenaline flowing through you will create, will cause the pain to disappear, but then it comes back the next day. And he called it adrenaline faith. Well, the next day we had another minister in, a uh, supposed evangelist, healing evangelist, you know, the big, and they put on a big show, and it was all letter, and it was all, you know, just stuff going on. And I could see, I was watching, I was probably from here, well, probably from here to that man sitting right there, just watching him. And, and I knew God spoke. I knew it. And he told me, and he, he said, that man needs some encouragement. Because he, what he was thinking, this is what God shared with me, is that everybody had forgotten about his message from the night before. And he turned to the guy that was leading the, this is a big church, several thousand people. And he turned to the minister, and he said, I'll see you tomorrow. And the way he said it, and the look on his face as he, as he got up from his chair, and he turned and he walked down the aisle, I knew God was speaking to me to go after him and say, you know, we'll not forget what you preached. And I didn't do it. And I think about it a lot. So when you disobey God, and you're really after his heart, and we miss it, you won't continue to do that. If I had my chance now to do it, I'd take the risk. Faith involves risk. When God speaks, it involves risk. The letter is easy to follow because there's no risk involved. It's comfortable for our flesh. Tradition is comfortable for our flesh. The Spirit of God coming in a service can be uncomfortable. And if you want God to do a new thing, we have to prepare our hearts to be ready to receive what is probably we've never thought of. Remember when I think Ray was here a couple of weeks ago, I, I watched him, and he was talking about uh, it has not entered into the heart of man, the, God, the things that God has prepared for us. And we all go, yay, boy, boy that's going to be so wonderful. Listen, anything you've thought of that can make you happy, it's not going to be that. Because that's already entered your heart. So if you think it's going to be a full church, and I think you talked about the overflow. And you think everybody's going to, you've already thought of that. I'm sorry, it's not going to be that. Well, it's going to be big healings, and we're going to clean out hospitals, and you've already thought of that. That's already entered your heart. It's going to be something that has not entered your heart. And when we find and we read through the scriptures, every time God showed up, most of his people were not ready for it and did not receive who he was. So we need to be hearing the voice of God. 
And when I read the Bible, I've just shared a couple of scriptures with you. How about this one? I know we've met, how about this one? I'm, 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 I think I'm almost done. Almost. I'm going to quote this scripture. He who has, who hears these sayings of mine and does them, is like a man who built what? A house on the what? On the rock. And the winds came, and the rain came, and the flood came, and beat against that house. But it stood because they did the sayings. But he who hears these sayings of mine and doesn't do them, the rain came, and the flood came, and the winds came, and great was that fall of that house. Every time I've heard that taught, it's talking about the circumstances in life. But what if, what if can, we, can we expand that scripture a little bit? What if it's talking about the things of the kingdom of God that's coming against your house? All, all of those things describe the kingdom of God. He reigns on the just and on the unjust. Came like a mighty rushing wind. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. There's your flood. Wind is irritating. Rain is irritating. Flood is irritating. Fire is irritating. How many fire songs do we have? So let's think spiritually. As long as I keep my distance from the fire, it's nice. But get in that fire and your flesh will be irritated real quick. All of the things we describe about God is irritating to our flesh. So when the winds come and the rain comes and the flood comes, when God reveals who he is, read through your Bible and you'll find many people, their house fell and great was its fall. It's not just the circumstances in life, although that happens, but it's also when the kingdom of God comes. I remember Pastor sharing with us. He said he preached a, a message of why I want to be left behind. Remember that? He shared that with us. He said, what did he lose? Seven families? <coughs> great was their fault. The kingdom of God came in a way that they weren't ready. And great was their fault. Jesus said to his disciples, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Where did many of his disciples go? He shared something that was totally contradictory to their culture, to their tradition, and they couldn't receive it, and they walked away. And he even looked at the 12 and said, do you also want to go? And what did Peter lose on the earth? We got nowhere else to go. Why? Because only you have the words of life. When he was talking about binding and loosing, go read the scripture. He said, who do men say that I am? And some said John the Baptist, and some said Jeremiah, and some said one of the prophets. And Peter said, who do you say that I am? Or Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and something was loosed in the earth that hadn't been loosed yet. He loosed, and then he turned right around and tried to bind it. Because Jesus began to share with him. And what was going to happen to him? And he said, far be it from you, Lord. See, he thought he was going to go two for two. He should have just kept his mouth shut. <laughs> and he said, who, far be it from you, Lord, that this should happen to you. And, of course, we know the rest of the story. <laughs> First you loosed me. Now you're trying to bind me. And how many times do we do that? <laughs> Where did I leave my glasses? Ah. I feel I should read a scripture, don't you think? <laughs> you know, people are going to go out there, well, that guy didn't even read out of the Bible. Oh, my goodness, I didn't even see that. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Boy, good job up there. Uh, turn with me to Galatians. Well, I'll just read out of Galatians. You can turn with me. This is out of the uh, New International. I am really big. Like I say, I'm church 
service on the kingdom of God and zeal that should be eating us up. And if we have this lackadaisical attitude, we're stuck somewhere in letter and tradition because that's what letter and tradition does, is it takes everything out of the kingdom of God. And we have a form of godliness, but we deny its power thereof. So let's try to make an effort to hear God's voice and see the value in this. When God starts speaking to you, it becomes addictive. That's right. It becomes addictive. And uh, because there's a life attached to it. You know, I brought up the abortion thing. It makes me wonder how many other things the church has loosed in the earth that's going on in the system. The opioid addiction. How many people come to church with a spiritual contraceptive over their heart? They want a good time in God, but they don't want to be born again and have children in God. Because children represent what? work. Your life is over. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or it should be. If you do it right, your life is over. It's changed. <laughs> you can't do what you want to do anymore. So if you think about that. Imagine having how many grains of sand do you think there are in the seashore? How many stars do you think there are? Imagine having that many kids. Well, God doesn't give them all to you at once. You get born again in one facet and then another facet and every facet he opens up, now you can enter into that kingdom, and you can enter into that. And so you get born again. Old Testament people were born again. Did you know that? No, oh, they, didn't, they didn't like that, I don't think. <laughs> I've taken your exclusiveness away from you. Sure it was. Old Testament people were born again. You say, well, how can you say that? Because Jesus, I'll give you some illustration. Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you shut up the kingdom of God. He said, you yourselves did not enter, and you were hindering those that were entering. Question, how could they enter? They had to be born again, right? Jesus hasn't gone to the cross yet. How did Moses see him who was invisible and esteem greater riches in Christ than all the treasures of Egypt? It says you have to be born again to see the kingdom of God, right? How did Abraham see Jesus' day and rejoice in it? They got born again in what was coming in the future. We get born again in what's already been done. That's right. So that's why we have a better covenant established on better promises. How could Abraham search for the city whose maker and builder is God? How could he even know one existed unless he could see some part of the kingdom of God? They got born again just like we did. This wasn't something new. Forgiveness didn't come at the cross. Born again didn't come at the cross. Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus came up with this brilliant you know, theological concept. How can you enter into your mother's womb again and be born again? And he said, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? How can, how can Jesus hold him responsible for that? Right. If you can't see the kingdom of God, you're not going to understand what born again is. But he was supposed to know. But he was stuck in his tradition and he was stuck in the letter. And the letter will kill you. It'll kill your passion. It'll kill anything God wants to do with you. But we use the letter in the hopes what? That God will speak through us again. Speak to it as, you know what I mean. <laughs> amen. <laughs> Thank you, amen. Whoever's ever said that. <clears throat> Are you in uh, Galatians? When did we quit praise and worship? You remember what time it was? I know. <laughs> but I don't want to choke people. You know what I mean? I always want to give so much. This is Galatians chapter 4, verse 27. For it is written, Be glad, O barren woman, who bears no children. Break now. Think spiritually, okay? Think about what I've been ministering this morning. It says, Who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, You who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now, what was Paul referring to there? What was he writing there? What, what is he, what's he talking about there? I mean, it sounds like I'm supposed to be rejoicing because I'm desolate? Absolutely. Because when you're desolate, you have nobody else to turn to but God. If you have a natural husband, then you've got somebody to fall back on. Think spiritually now. If you have a husband, you have somebody else to fall back on. But if you have no husband, how are you going to have children? 
There's only one way, and that is that God is talking about all the children that you can have while being born again and born again and born again. And you'll have many more children when you have nobody to fall back on but God than you're going to have if you stay in the letter or in tradition. Husband represents the tradition or the letter or the world system. Do you realize that the devil... The devil, his plan is to bring you salvation without God. It's not, it, 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 the fruit of, the, of that is the stealing, killing, and destroying. Jesus said, I am the door to the sheepfold. Anybody who what? Climbs up some other way. The same as the thief and robber. And then he turns, and you know the familiar scripture, the thief comes but for to steal, kill, and to destroy. It's the devil's plan to give you salvation without God. Why? He doesn't care about you. I'm not saying he's got the same motivation as God. He wants to stick his nose in God, or finger in God's nose and say, I can do what you can do. I can ascend to the Most High. I can be just like you. I can do everything you can do. I can take your word and I can make it better without God. Go back to the, the original sin in the garden. What was it? Partake of this tree without God and you'll live forever. That was his promise. What's our promise in Jesus? Partake of him and what? Live forever. So we're to rejoice when we have nothing to fall back on. You notice, and this is how God works with me, okay? I know he works with you with outlines and notes and things like that. You notice I have no notes. I don't have any scripture references. Why? Because I have to fall because I have no husband. I have no schooling. I never was given any speech in school. I don't know anything about homiletics, hermiletics, whatever letics there are. I know nothing about them. I can only depend upon God. That's all I have to fall back on. Amen. When I preach, that's all I have. I have nothing else. I was terrified of people. I didn't like people. You know what I wanted to be when I was young? This is dorky. I wanted to be a mountain man. I didn't know you couldn't be one. <laughs> Well, when you're young, you don't know that. But I didn't want to be around people. I wanted to live by myself forever until I died. What's changed me? What got into me that I now care about people? Yes. Who changed me? Who caused me to be able to speak in front of me? I used to take Fs. I'd read the book, book reports. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get up and I'd just take an F. I'd say, oh, I didn't read it. I'd lie. I know everybody has stage fright, but mine was, was a spirit of fear. It wasn't just stage fright. It was enough to control and rule my life that I couldn't do anything verbally in front of people. You'd never know it now, though, would you? You're, you're just seeing part of, the finished, part of the finished product. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I love living without fear of people. Man, they'd scare me to death. I couldn't go to movies. I couldn't do anything. I was afraid to go to the bathroom. I'd wet my pants. Because I was afraid if I went in the bathroom, I'd have to, there'd be people in there. I think I've shared that before, haven't I? Probably not. You've got some new people here that you never So it's always been the devil's plan to bring man salvation. That should revolutionize how you look at things. If he can't do it through the world system, through the temptations of the world, what is salvation? What is salvation? Rescue, deliverance, health, safety, soul peace. Isn't that what everybody's searching for? Everybody that's doing drugs, everybody that's in crime, everybody that goes to movies, everybody that, that, that they're all looking for that. And if he can't tempt you with the world's wares, he'll try to tempt you with God things without God. And we get things out of order. I'm on a roll. I might as well blow the whole thing. I've just got one more thing to say. This is where things get out of order. And I, I'm, I've been, you know, I should be like Peter. I should just shut up. Because I think I'm on pretty good ground right now. <laughs> I know. I'm trying to make a little light out of this in a way. The manifestations, yeah, hope you can handle this. 
the manifestations of the Holy Spirit are not really a part of the kingdom of God. <laughs> I knew what I should have said. <laughs> I didn't say they weren't a part of God. I said they're not a part of the kingdom. Divine help is the kingdom of God. The manifestations are a catalog description it's a pipeline, it's a conduit, it's a ladder from heaven to earth. It's a mercy that God gave us to show us what the kingdom of God is like. But it's not the kingdom of God. Because Paul writes and he says, when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. And his kingdom is what? An everlasting kingdom. So if something's done away, it can't be a part of the kingdom. It's a conduit. It's a ladder, so to speak. The letter, so it's a catalog description. How many, this is very simple. How many of you ever, you order something, online is probably better, but those of us that are older, we used to order things by catalog. Did you ever cut the catalog picture out or when you order online, you keep the item online and you keep looking at the item online and they give you a tracking number? What do you guys do with that tracking number? And do what? What are you looking for? You're seeing where it's at, right? And as it gets closer, how does your anticipation level increase? When you find out it's out in the mail for delivery today, and I mean it's something that you desire and want. It's not a self-tooth-pulling kit or something like that. <laughs> you really don't want to get there, you know what I mean? And you got to understand, we live in Iowa, so that's big entertainment for us, is to follow that tracking number. <laughs> We don't have anything else. <laughs> so we'll click on that thing two or three times a day to see where that thing is at, man. We will. And when it says out for delivery, it's, oh man, it's almost here. And as soon as the real thing gets here, what do you do with the item on your computer? Delete. You hit delete. Can you imagine somebody coming over to my house and I've cut all these catalog pictures of furniture out and I've taped them to the floor and I cut out a, a big screen TV and I stick it on the wall and I say, hey, just sit right down, look at my new screen TV. You'd think I was a nut. But that's what we do in the church. We, we get a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. We call it the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is here. Jesus, whenever he healed somebody, he said, the kingdom of God has come near you. Manifestations of the Holy Spirit are a tracking number. And it lets you know that the kingdom of God is near. And it's supposed to increase your anticipation of what's coming. It's supposed to focus you on something else. I'm done. sure how to take that. <laughs> no, I know what it is. Yeah, thank you. And I'm thank you that most everybody I've looked at has received what God has said this morning. And I want you to keep these things. I want to leave a deposit here that you can read scriptures and find new meanings in them. I'm not talking about going into La La Land and getting new age or anything like that. I'm talking about every parable, everything that God has said, everything that God has uh, written down in this Bible can be opened up. There are, there are things we can get born again in in the number of the sand of the sea. So don't get stuck in a tradition. Don't get stuck in doing stuff. Always be open for God redefining something or cutting down an asterisk pole that needs to be cut down, burned, pulverized, and spread out. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand? Thank you, Lord. What a word. Yeah. Woo. I'm glad we don't have that teeth pulling kit. Because we, 
we need the teeth to chew on this <laughs> for a while. I mean, what are we going to loose today and this week? Oh, God, that we would loose your heart and your mind over our own lives first and every situation we come in contact with. Father, may we do that by your spirit, by your voice, by your leading, by your guiding. And only what you're saying. Church, can you just say thank you, Lord? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for your word this morning. Thank you for instruction in righteousness this morning. Thank you for that correction that has come to our hearts this morning. That reproof, that level setting that we need from time to time by your word and by the message that's spoken by your servant. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. For your word is eternal. It never changes. And it's the foundation that we build our lives upon. That you build your life in us upon. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord one last hoorah. <laughs> thank you, Lord. You're worthy, God. You're worthy. Worthy Lord, we exalt your name, God, for who you are. For who you are, God. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for these moments we've had together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. up right now in hearts right now he's just sealing that word right now and he's speaking that word let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus let it loose loose it out release it this morning thank you Lord. glory to your name hallelujah amen you are dismissed this morning um, remember, night of worship on Wednesday. Come on, man. You heard the word this morning. Come on. Let's gather corporate ignition on Wednesday night. Amen? All right. Thank you, pastors, for being here.